Let me just uh, refresh your memory a little bit about what uh, the book of Joshua, I should say. The book of Joshua is concerned with the Israelites after leaving Egypt coming into Canaan. And what we find in that book of Joshua that we've covered in the last week or so is the uh, fact that Joshua, taking over the command after, after Moses, goes into uh, Canaan, and what we get a series of lessons concerned, series of the stories concerning the, 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 the capture of Canaan, uh, from, or the capture of Palestine from the Canaanites. And uh, this is where we get the uh, very interesting story of the fall of Jericho and of Ai, and then a chapter in which we find that Joshua and his troops march up one side of the Jordan River and down the other side, and in the process dispose of 31 different kings. And after getting, after all the uh, conquering, then he takes upon himself in that book of Joshua to divvy up the land among the Israelites. And so we find the last bit of the, of the book is, is devoted to who is going to live in what part of Canaan. The last chapter in the book of Judges is quite different, and I think I have a slide. Let's see what it is? The Shechem Council. What is a council? Those were a, a lot of the people got together, and in, in the book of Judges, what it suggests that all the people that were in, now in their territory that had been assigned to them had gotten together and they had a council, and in that council, some very significant things were to take place. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads of the judges and the officers of the Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers lived, and, and lived of old beyond the Euphrates, terror of the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. In that, in that chapter, it takes all the way to my back that they are now serving a God that had been the God of their forefathers, and that is, that is the God that brought them out of Egypt. And, he, and, and this, is, this is what it says in, uh, a little further. Then I gave you the land in which you did not labor, and the cities which you did not build, and you dwell, you dwell there. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him, the sincerity and faithfulness and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river. Who are the gods the fathers served beyond the river? The, 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 the Baals, the, the Canaanite, uh, uh, Canaanite deities. All that's happening in this first part of this chapter is that he's telling them to remember what has happened to them in terms of their relationship with their God, a God which traces, they trace all the way back to Terah, the father of Abraham. Now, in the next part, then the people answered, Why be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods? For it is the Lord our God that brought us here, and uh, they, they renumerate the fact that God has done a lot for them. What is implied here is that suddenly these 12 tribes, having been assigned territory in Canaan, now became a nation, and a nation in which they had one God, and they had some unity. This becomes kind of important when we take a look at some things that we're going to talk about today, is how did they get together. My own feeling is that something like this Shechem Council actually did take place sometime, but right after they settled into Canaan, I don't think it came that fast. It came a little bit later. Now we move from there to the book of Judges. And I mentioned that they, they, they swore, there's all the elders and everybody swearing that, and then again, a monument was set up, a stone was set up to uh, commemorate the fact that, okay, that now we are a nation under God. Now we come to the book of Judges. Originally, I had planned to 
give a lesson talking about a lesson from the book of Judges. After thinking about it a bit last night and this morning, I have concluded I'm not going to be teaching the book of Judges. I'm going to teach you, I'm going to try to give you a little information about the book of Judges. It is a very, very strange book in many different ways. The book of Judges tells us that there are people that in a period, in the days of the judges, a number of people, 12 different judges. Just take a look at this chart. As soon as you hear 12 judges and 12 tribes, what do you immediately think? One judge for each tribe. That isn't what happened at all. You take a look at this and you find out that some tribes did not have uh, uh, their, the, the other tribes. Some tribes like Manasseh, there are three judges that came from Manasseh, and uh, there are other judges that are not represented here at all. The days of the judges. Another thing we're going to mention in the next slide is that there's a, well, take a look at this list right here. These are the number of years of rest. This is the number of years. Keep that number in mind when we take a look at the next slide. It's, Chapter 2 of Judges does a very interesting thing. It tells us that what you're going to see in looking at this book is that there is a pattern that seemed to be followed, that the people were following during the days of the Judges. It was sort of a cyclic situation. There would be a, a time when there was peace, and then the people would fall into idolatry. God is angry. They would be oppressed by somebody, and people would cry out, and God would send a judge, and the judge would take them back to a period of peace, and the judge dies, and the cycle would repeat itself. And this is what we do see when we take a look at the stories of the books of the judges. There are periods of peace, and there are periods where they are in distress. I'll go back one slide. If you take a look at this slide, days of the judges, how many days were these? The best I can figure is that the period of Judges probably started around 1200 B.C. and was, was over by uh, 1100 B.C., only about a period of 100 years. Well, you can see there are more years of peace here than 100 years. So what, what we find here in this book of, of, uh, of Judges is something that's not really typical of the Old Testament and of ancient history, and it's very difficult to deal with dates. Uh, Larry brought me over a book on uh, chronology in Egypt. The Egyptians were fanatics on trying to keep dates straight, and they managed to, to be very careful in giving us something like about 31 different dynasties over a period of 3,000 years. You should see what they went through to try to figure out where these dates were. The same thing is true here. Don't pay too much attention to dates. This is more than 100 years, far more than 100 years. But that cycle does exist, and you'll see that same sort of thing happening over and over again, that there will be a period where they're, they're, they're doing well, and then they fall back into idolatry. And then they have trouble. And then, then some enemy will come along, they get out, they get upset, and then get a judge to produce peace until the judge dies and they start doing the same thing over and over again. Now, if we take a look at the, the previous slide again, we see a number of judges, but there are some judges here that we know practically nothing about at all. There are some that we know quite a bit about. We know about Ehud, we, we know about Jephthah, and uh, where is it, Gideon, and uh, Samson, we're quite familiar with some of those, but some of these other judges appear in the book of Judges in a rather interesting fashion. Well, before I uh, go any further, I want to say here is a verse that shows up quite often in the book of Judges. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what, he, what was right in his own eyes. <coughs> Here again, we gotta take a look at the situation. Who was writing this and for whom was, it, was he writing? 
very likely the Deuteronomic historian that is writing this book of Judges, probably Jeremiah. And he is writing this right at the time that King Josiah died. And Jeremiah was a great admirer of King Josiah because Josiah was the one that brought about a rebellion against the worship of all these idols and the fact that there should be more of a paying attention to what was in the book of Deuteronomy and that they should be worshiping God and God alone. And Josiah is, is cited in, in, the, in the Old Testament as being one of only two really good kings. The other one was Hezekiah. They are the only ones that got rid of all of the foreign idols and had them destroyed. Jeremiah thought very highly of that because in this particular verse here, as I say, the same sort of verse shows up in other places in Judges. We find out that the people that we uh, encounter as Judges did, did things that would counteract the way people behave. Uh, when I was looking at this, I was remembering a story that I found rather interesting. And that is that if you wanted to get guidance, one way of doing it is going to the Bible. You could very easily use guidance from the book of Judges, provided the guidance shows you in the direction of child sacrifice, killing children, and shows you that the worship of idols and the, the making of graven images is perfectly all right. And it reminded me of a story of the man who Told, uh, told his friend, he said, there isn't anything that I have any trouble with that I cannot go to the Bible and open it anywhere and point to a place and there will be a verse that tells me what to do and I can get all that guidance I need from the Bible. Well, if you were to, put, to do the book of uh, Judges, you'd say, hey, just a second, this is the sort of guidance you need. This man illustrated his, his uh, ability to a friend of his by opening up the book, and you open it up to the, the book of Esther. And in the book of Esther, there's a, there's a villain by the name of Haman. And ever Haman has, has been, uh, Haman has been found out to be guilty. It says, and then Haman left the room and went and hanged himself. The man said, well, just a second, I, I went to the Old Testament. Maybe I should go to the New Testament. I get better advice than the New Testament. So he opened it a second time and went to one of Jesus' uh, sermons, and it just simply said, go ye and do likewise. <laughs> <laughs> you could run into the same trouble if you, if you use the book of Judges as, as a source, because we find that the judges were very often, or the people were very often in practices that would not be acceptable today. Here are a couple of illustrations of what I mean about that, the, we know so little about some of these people. After Abimelech came to deliver it, Tola. We don't know anything more about him other than what we have here. And then Jair. There are two judges where we don't have any more than a sentence. Where on the other hand, movies have been made on Samson. And, uh, and we're talking a little bit about Gideon. Great stories with some of the other judges. Ehud is one of the first of the judges. And there is a story on him. There's another thing about these stories and that these stories that we have concerning the judges have one thing I think in common is it's very easy to associate those stories with the kind of entertainment that the people of Israel might have had at that time. They did not have Monday night football or anything like that. They had to rely on storytelling so they would tell great stories. Sometimes these stories, even as we find them in, uh, in our Bible, our, our, the Bible that we use today are sometimes a bit on the earthy side. And the story of Ehud is a, is a good example of that. Ehud was uh, one of the first of the judges, and at the time we were told that the uh, Israelites were being oppressed by the Moabites, and there was a king of Moab by the name of Agon. And this is the this is the story. This is all we have. Uh, talks about uh, Agon. But he himself turned back to his sculptured stones near Gilgal and said, I have a secret. He's talking to Aegon. He's talking to the, the, the king Aegon. I have a secret message for you, O king. 
and he commands silence. And for all his attendants that went out of his presence, they made no thing to him. And he was sitting alone in his roof, roof, cool roof chamber. And Ahab said, I have a message from God for you. And he rose from his seat. And Ahab reached with his left hand and took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt went all the way up to his blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the sword out of his belly, and the dirt came out. The previous section here talks about the fact that Ehud is left-handed, and so he had the sword on the, on the right side, so that he could hide the sword on his right side, but he dreaded it out with his left hand, and, and, and stabbed this man. And uh, like I say, a little bit further, I think I, I think I have a little bit more. There's a picture of Ehud. Uh, the story also goes a little bit further that uh, Aegon's attendants wondered, why don't we hear anything from him? They didn't want to disturb him because they thought that he was relieving himself, that he was in the bathroom, they didn't want to interrupt him now. They didn't realize that he had been killed by, by Ehud. And the Lord was with Judah and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. And Hebron was given to Caleb as Moses had said, and he drove out the, the, the sons of Anak. The first chapter of Judges is one of the more peculiar chapters that we have in the Old Testament. It tells, first of all, I think I've mentioned this many times, that if you go back to Joshua, it says that Joshua conquered all these different places and disposed of 31 different kings. But that first chapter of, of Judges says what you read is probably not true. Did not get rid of all of these kings. As a matter of fact, that first part of that book, uh, that first part of that chapter doesn't deal with that at all. It just deals with one tribe, the tribe of Judah. And that tribe of Judah, a little bit of said here, and the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country but he could not drive the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. And Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had said, and he drove out from, the, from it the three sons of Anak. And the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who dwelt in Jerusalem. And the Jebusites uh, have dwelt with the people of Benjamin who in Jerusalem to this day. But here we're going to mention the name Caleb. Does anybody know where we first encountered Caleb in the Old Testament? When, when Moses came with the, with, the, with the people out of Egypt, before going into Canaan, he sent out 12 spies. And those 12 spies were to spy out Canaan to find out what it was like. Well, 12 spies came back with a report that this was a, this was a great place. And I'm jumping the gun. That it was a great place. I think I have a picture, of, you all have seen the picture of the spies coming back with a great big bunch of grapes saying this is a land of, of milk and honey, a place that we should go into immediately. That was Joshua and Caleb said that. The other 10 spices, you should see the size of those people, they're giants. There's no way that we could conquer them. And they, they uh, as the Old Testament says it often, they murmured. And they murmured against Moses and against Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb wanted immediately to go into, into Canaan and, and conquer those Canaanites and take possession of that land. The people were so afraid that they actually wanted to stone Caleb and Joshua. And uh, God was very disappointed in the people. As a matter of fact, the fact that they behaved the way they did he essentially threatened to do away with all of them. But apparently Joshua and Caleb had talked him out of that, don't do away with all of them. Rather do this, do not let anybody over the age of 20 ever get into Canaan. With the exception of two people, Joshua and Caleb, they were, they, because they had a positive attitude, they could go into Canaan when the, when the time came. The rest of them are going to have to wait for 40 years before they were going to get into Canaan. That's why we have 40 years 
of the uh, Israelites in the desert before they entered Canaan after, after leaving Egypt. One of them was Caleb, and we're told that Caleb came from the tribe of Judah. Now what the first chapter of Judges does is tells us what Caleb did. It says it did it right after Joshua died, but there are reasons to believe it may, it may have been even earlier than that, that, uh, that Caleb had decided that, hey, why are we waiting? Before I go into the details of that, let me just ask you a question. When we take a look at what we read, we find that Jacob went to Egypt with a, with a household of 72 people. And then we we're told by the time that Moses wanted to lead the Israelites out, there were 600,000 men plus their, plus their families. And the total number of people that probably emanated from Jews, uh, Israel's family, uh, Jacob's family was probably close to two million. Now, here's another fact. You can figure that one out yourself. I tried it myself. If each of those 72 people, if there were uh, 12 men, and each of them had two sons, and each son had two sons, it wouldn't take too long before you have a sizable number of people. By the time you get to six, uh, 40 years, you have enough generations. There could very well have been 600,000 men that had emanated from, from Jacob's family. Now, you're faced with an interesting situation. It is also a fact that the, uh, there's no evidence that at any point there was a situation where 600,000 or 2 million people left Egypt at one time under the direction of Moses. If that were the case, when they got to the River Jordan and got across the, and had to cross at Gilgal, there were 2 million people waiting to cross the River Jordan to get across to Gilgal and go to, to Jericho. There's no two million, a lot of people. Uh, either that happened, well, either that happened or it didn't happen. If it didn't happen, how do you account for the fact that all of these Israelites that had been in Egypt now find themselves in Canaan? They didn't do it all at one time. They did it piecemeal. One of the current theories is that, uh, that, that the biblical scholars are working on, let me drink of water here a minute. I was told by my boss sitting over there in the corner that if I get tired, I gotta, gotta quit. <laughs> I'm not tired yet. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what one of the one of the ideas that uh, biblical scholars are working on right now. How did the Israelites leave Egypt and come into Canaan? Almost two million people. Well, let's look at it from a standpoint of common sense. The people that were in Egypt that came along with Jacob were there because of the fact that one of the boys, this Joseph, was one of the premiers of, uh, of Egypt at that time. And the book, of, uh, the book of Exodus makes it very clear that that must have been a good time for the Israelites to be in Egypt. But it says there came a time when there came a Pharaoh that did not know Joseph. What happens to the, uh, what happens to the Israelites now? If I, were, if I were in that family, I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised that uh, people would look around and say, look, we don't have the protection of Joseph anymore. What might be a good idea to get out of here and leave? And one theory is that almost immediately there started to be an emigration out of Egypt by some of these peoples. One of them might have been uh, uh, the uh, people from Judah led by Caleb, and they may have been responsible for settling down in the southern part of, of uh, Canaan, and that's why Judah became such a prominent part of the, of the Israelite nation. But then over a period of years, other groups would leave, and they would leave to other parts of, uh, 
of Canaan. After one family would leave, it wouldn't be too su surprising if there were people that were of that same tribe say, hey, let's, uh, let's us go too and go and settle where those other people had settled. I, don't, I think most of you may have run into this in your own lives. I ran into it in my life in this regard, and that is that <coughs> when I was growing up, uh, I spent a lot of time with my mother at, uh, at, at her parents' house on uh, 11th Street. And uh, I am almost convinced that a good part of the neighbors that they had on 11th Street between Fairbanks and, and Lincoln Avenue were from the province of Frisian because they would be getting together all the time and talking Frisian and talking about things they did in the old country. In other words, when people move from one country to another country, where are they likely to go? Were there people like themselves? And it wouldn't take too long before, say, one, one group from Zebulon might land in some place r relatively close to the uh, Sea of Galilee. And then it would, in the next uh, 50, 60 years, a bunch of other people that were of the tribe of Zebulon say, let's, let's just go to Canaan too. And little by little, the, the, the possible six or two million people were drained off into Canaan that way. There is some merit to this idea. I meant to show you this. Here is a book that recently came out that's devoted almost entirely to who was Judah and what was the tribe of Judah and why is it so different when we look at Judah in the Old Testament. Judah is the, 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 the southern part of Canaan, and it was a, a kingdom unto itself until it was joined with the ten tribes to the north. And this man wrote a book looking at this whole situation, indicating that the tribe of Judah may have arisen in a very different way. They may have been there hundreds of years before the other uh, Israelites came into Canaan. I meant to uh, have this on uh, as a current, say this is uh, an advertisement for this book in the current issue of uh, Biblical Archaeology. It is now uh, uh, taken from the previous month of uh, Biblical Archaeology, but it's a current book that's receiving quite a bit of attention, and I'm looking forward to reading some of the reviews to see what this man has to say. He is a fairly well-known scholar Russian scholar and has written other books as well, but it, it, it's indicating that there are people that are addressing themselves to that question, where did these Israelites, how did these Israelites get from Egypt into Canaan? Is there a background that they have in Egypt? What is one of the things that the Jews always remember when they talk about their history? That God had taken them out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land. So they knew there was an Egyptian background. So at one time, most of them had ancestors that lived in, 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 uh, in Egypt. Oh, here's the grapes. And as I pointed out, this all shows up in the Book of Numbers. In the Book of Numbers, we get the story of the 12 tribes that were sent out and the fact that uh, 10, 10, 10, of the, 10 of the spies were very scared about going into the land of giants and only Joshua and Caleb said, no, let's go now. And both of them are the only two, according to the Bible, that ever got into Canaan. Anyone over the age of 20 died in the desert before they got there. In the case of Joshua, we know that Joshua led the, uh, led the uh, assault on the uh, Canaanite tribes. And, and in this first chapter of uh, Judges shows us that that Caleb also played a rather significant role in establishing what became the uh, what became the uh, how do I say it? what became the the, the 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 part of Canaan that is called Judah, and uh, that that Caleb, who was from the tribe, he was the spy from the tribe of Judah. One of the one of the one of the uh, judges, which we do have some rather detailed information, is Gideon. Gideon shows up fairly early. 
Actually, I'll talk a little bit about another one in a few moments. Deborah was one of the first. Deborah was the only woman judge. <coughs> she was successful in having recruited Barak as her, uh, as her military leader, uh, fighting against uh, Cesera, who was a, uh, a military leader trying to get the Canaanites together to drive the Israelites out. Cicero was not successful in doing that, uh, but the, we'll see that story a little bit later. But after, after, after Deborah, we get this man, uh, Gideon. The interesting thing about Gideon is that not only do we have some details, but he is one of the judges that we are told was actually called by God to act as a judge. Here we have Joshua from the tribe of Manasseh and is approached by an angel and told that he is going to be the one that's going to deliver the Israelites from the, the problems that they're having at that time with the Midianites. The Midianites were, were, were a tribe from way down south who had been invading that territory and causing a lot of problems. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Joshua was not unlike some of the other people that were called to do something. He said, no, I don't think I'm going to be up to this. And <coughs> What the angel had him do was to prepare a, uh, a meat and some uh, bread. And I think he killed a kid. That's not a child, a kid, a baby goat. And prepared a meat in the broth and took the meat in the broth and some biscuits and put them on a stone. I don't think I've got a picture of that. Put, them on, put it on a stone, and the angel simply touched the stone, and the uh, whole thing went into flames and consumed the kid and, and, the, and the bread and the broth. And uh, this made Joshua believe, made, uh, made Gideon believe that maybe he was being called by God to do what? To rid them of the, the problem they were having with the Midianites. Now, who were the Midianites? Midian, if, I don't think I have the map here. Midian is a province that is way down south. It's on the, on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba. And these Midianites were way up there in the northern part of, uh, of, of Canaan, causing problems to the people in Manasseh and some of the people in, in other parts of, the, of, of Israel. The reason they were able to do this is that I found something I cannot not find the reference again, that, that the Midianites had a, an interesting uh, means of warfare that made them unique. You know what it was? They were the one of the first ones to use the camel as, as a military tool. They knew that the camel had certain capabilities that were rather important. One is that a camel could live for a reasonable length of time with a limited amount of water and, and food. This, and they also traveled very rapidly. And apparently, according to this reference that I had read, the, uh, the Midianites made use of the fact that they could travel great distances in a rather short time and raid some places that they normally would not have to deal with uh, raiders. And they became rather proficient. And they were doing this to the people in the northern tribes and this is why, this, this is why uh, Gideon was called. Gideon was called to uh, get rid of the uh, uh, get rid of the uh, Midianites. That's not the end of the story. What happened is that Gideon was told to recruit people to to uh, perform a military might against the Gideonites. And he was quite successful in doing that because a lot of people want to get those Midianites out of there. And says that he got together a group of about 32,000 people that were ready to fight against the Midianites. When God made it clear to uh, Gideon that that's too many people, tell any of the people that want to to go home if they want to go home. And 22,000 went home and they left Gideon with 10,000 men rather than 32,000 men. And God said, that still is too many. So you've got to get this down to a, a rather, rather a smaller number. And so Gideon had to find a way of determining who were going to the people that would go along with him. 
he was told he only needed 300, 300 out of 32,000. He came up with a, uh, he came up with an interesting idea. He would find out which ones would go along with him by bringing them to a stream. Oh, to this little bit. I want to go back to this a little bit. He would bring them to a stream. And find out how they behaved when they came to the stream as far as drinking. Some would they go all the way down and drink right directly to the stream. Others would raise up their hand and drink out of their hand. Of the 10,000 people that were still left, there were only 300 that drank their water in this fashion. They laughed it like they said, like a dog. And of those 300, Gideon was told he now would uh, uh, be able to get rid of the, uh, the Midianites, just the 300 against, uh, well, they say that, <coughs> I wish I had a picture of this, I couldn't find one, of the, of the Midianite camp with all the, the Midianites sitting around there or laying or going to sleep or next to their camels. It must have been quite a sight because there were, were thousands of them. But Gideon is going to get rid of them with 300 men. <laughs> what he did is he took, took the 300 men, divided them into three groups, each of 100 group, and, and each of the groups were given the instruments of fighting the war. What they were told to do, is, what they were given was a, a, a pot, a crockery a pot, crockery, and in that pot of crockery they would be holding a torch, a lit torch, in one hand. <coughs> in the other hand they would have a trumpet. <coughs> they didn't have any swords or anything like that, but they got on the three sides of the Midianite camp, and at, at the signal from Joshua they broke those, those pots, and the, the, the flames from the torches blazed up and put the uh, Midianites who were sleeping into a real panic and trying to get away because they didn't know what had happened because all of a sudden this great noise <coughs> and all of a sudden this bright light of all these torches and they ended up killing each other trying to get away. And anyway, in that way, Gideon was successful in getting the Midianites out of, out of Palestine. <coughs> Something I should have mentioned earlier that Gideon was not uh, regarded very highly by his family. <coughs> his family was very much involved in Baal worship, and one of the things that Gideon had to do was to separate his family from Did I kill it? Separated family, and right after he had been approached by the angel the first time, he went out that evening and chopped down the Asher, chopped down, he was chopping down one of the Baal idols and, uh, and chopping down all of the things that were involved in the worship of Baal, which his family was very heavy in. This made a lot of people very unhappy with, with, uh, with Gideon. His was sort of an uphill battle, to say the least. Here are a couple pictures of the, uh, oh, here's another strange story. Uh, the night before the, the attack of the uh, Midianites, uh, Gideon wondered if he was going to be successful. And he went to sleep on a, on a, on a, on a fleece. What is a fleece? I think it's a goat skin or a sheep skin went to sleep on a fleece. When he woke up from the fleece, there was dew all around the fleece, but none on the fleece. And he thought that rather strange the next time he went to sleep. This time the dew was all on the fleece and none on the ground. Again, he felt that this was a sign from the Lord that he was going to be doing the right thing. <coughs> it also tells a story that Gideon actually went into the Midianite camp and he overheard Two of the Midianites talking, one talking about the fact that he had a dream 
he had a dream that there was a cake of barley came rolling into the camp and knocked down some of the tents. And the cake of barley meant uh, something akin to the uh, Israelites or the, the Israelites are living in Canaan because they were farmers. A lot of this took place in the Jezreel Valley, which was an agricultural center at that time. And so Gideon felt confident that, that the, the, the roofs that he was to pull the next night was going to be successful. Here's another picture of the You know, when I, when I was reading about this, I was remembering something <coughs> that I found at the time very humorous. You may not, but I'm going to tell you anyway. How many of you remember Philip Morris cigarettes? You, you remember who was the, the spokesman for Philip Morris cigarettes? Johnny, the, the bellhop who went to the whole hotel, what's it, call for Philip Morris, you've heard that. At that time, that was a very successful advertising campaign because everybody recognized who Johnny was, the bellhop. And at that time, if you can remember this far back, before we had the internet, people would walk up and down the main street and look at things that were in the store windows. Remember store windows? <laughs> thing to do to get the proper thing in the store. One of the most popular items in the store windows at that time was a cardboard cutout of Johnny the Bellhop say call for Philip Morris. This was an advertising campaign of people of Philip Morris. And you find these in store windows all over the country. <laughs> The story goes that in Hollywood at one point, people were sitting in this restaurant when a waiter dropped a whole tray full of, of uh, dishes and everything, you know, a crashing boom, and dead silence all over everything. Well, can you imagine when it happened, a whole tray of dishes was splashing to the floor? Nobody said anything except Groucho Marx, and you know what he had to say? That was Johnny stepping out of store windows all over the country. <laughs> In other words, a huge crash like that can have quite a surprising effect. And that was the same sort of thing that uh, Gideon was making use of the fact that we'd be breaking the pottery. You drop a dish once, uh, it, it can make quite a, quite a bit of noise. Let's move on to another one. Jephthah. Jephthah was a very successful, very successful military man. And a good part of the story of Jephthah deals about the conquest that he had had. The story of Jephthah that we find in, in, in the book of Judges is quite different in another regard, and that is that it's only a very small portion. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if thou wilt give the Ammonites into my hand, then whoever comes forth from the doors of my house to meet me when I return victorious from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's and I will offer him up as a burnt offering. He makes this vow that if he's successful in the war against the Ammonites, whoever is the first one to greet him when he comes back home, he's going to give up to the Lord as a sacrifice. Here is the whole story. There's a little bit that I just read here. And when, when he comes home, does anybody remember what happened? The first person to greet him was his daughter. And uh, his, only, his only child, but he had made that vow. And you can see the distraught look on, on Jephthah's face when he realizes here, this is the one that he's going to have to sacrifice. The story that I had on the previous slide is all that we have. In this story, we find Jephthah making the vow of his meeting his daughter. And then his daughter accepting the fact that yes, she's gonna meet this fate of having to be sacrificed as a, as a human sacrifice. And all she does is ask for time to spend with her girlfriends before she has to be killed. And some of the best paintings I could find were pictures of, of uh, the daughter with her girlfriends. I think I got a couple of these. 
say that uh, that's the old thing where a child sacrificed during the period of the judges then was something that was considered acceptable. And how prevalent was child sacrifice? It's really kind of hard to say, but do we have any other instances of what was Abraham about to do with Isaac? Sacrifice Isaac. And then we find that when we get to the time of, uh, of, of uh, Manasseh, who was the grandfather of uh, Josiah, that there was child sacrifice being practiced by some of the Israelites themselves. So child sacrifice goes pretty far into the, into my, into the biblical history. Here's a little bit about Deborah. Very quickly, she's the only woman that is regarded as, as a judge. And we're told that she sat underneath a palm tree, I think it was an Ephraim, and people would come to her to be judged. And she was called upon to relieve the uh, Israelites from the oppression that they were feeling from this Canaanite uh, military man, Sesera. Sesera was giving them trouble. Deborah is not about to go into battle herself, but she does call her top military person, that was Barak, and she convinces Barak that he should get an army together to go up against Sesera. And Barak is doubtful, but she convinces him that the Lord will be with you and you will be successful. But she tells Barak, but she tells Barak you will be successful against Sesera but you will not get the credit for it. The credit will go to a woman. Now immediately when you think about Deborah being the judge, that the credit will go to Deborah. That isn't what happened at all. What happened is that Barak was successful in routing Sesera's army, and Sesera escaped. Sesera escaped and tried to get away as fast as he could, and to escape being uh, uh, killed by, by Barak. And in the process of escaping, he came across the tent of a woman by the name of Jael, J-A-E-L. And all we know about her is that she was the wife of Heber, who was a, uh, who was a, a Kenite, actually, and came from the region of Midian at one time. But Sesra comes up to Jael in her tent and asks, can, she asks, can I help you? And Sesra says, yes, I need help. And she says, well, go and rest in my, uh, in my tent, and I'll bring you a, a cup of milk. She brought her, her Deborah under the tree with the barack. And when Sesra got, Sesra got into the tent, he fell asleep, and J.O. comes along, and you know what she has here is spike. And she drove the spike right straight through the Sesera's head, and that was the end of Sesera. And so, uh, what uh, Deborah had said was correct. The credit of getting rid of Sesera is not going to go to Barak. It went to, to jail. Samson. I'm not going to say too much about Samson. Except again, there are some things that are very familiar about Samson. He killed a lion with his bare hands. And at one point, when he went to the city of Gaza, they tried to capture him, but what he did was took the doors of the city and carried the doors to the top of the hill because Samson was known for what? Strength. How many of you remember Samson card tables? The card table that you could rely on and it was strong enough. <laughs> And Samson luggage to take anything that uh, that uh, happened in, in their travels. Now, what have I got time? That uh, oh, I haven't gotten tired yet. <coughs> Some of them are still awake. Like I said, the, this book of uh, Judges is a very peculiar one because the last five chapters do not seem to be about, the, about judges at all. There are five chapters that sort of stand out by themselves. And uh, really we should spend more time on those chapters than I'm going to. They both start out as stories. 
And again, you can see that the probably are stories that emanated from the nighttime entertainment these people have are telling stories. <coughs> In one of these stories, it starts out with a man returning money to his mother that he had stolen from his mother. <coughs> that money that he had stolen, he gave to his mother. And she said, thank you. I had planned to use this money to do something special. What I wanted to do was to have a graven idol made from this money. And, and uh, this man's name was Michael, <coughs> said, or Micah. We'll still have that idol made. So they made a graven idol with that money that was returned. Now, what has this got to do with, uh, with the Book of Judges? Well, that idol then became a sort of a center of, uh, of the household of that man, Michael, where they, uh, where they had this, uh, this idol. Among other idols, he had a number of things that were what you might call his <coughs> household gods. Have you heard of the expression household gods before in the Old Testament? Remember when Jacob was leaving Laban with his family? That Rachel stole the household gods of Laban. <coughs> it apparently was not uncommon to have household gods. And, and what uh, Michael had was, was a room that was devoted just to these gods, a place for worship of these graven images. He even made his son the priest of that room. And as things would happen, a Levite happened to come through that region. And he adopted that Levite as one of his sons and, and appointed that Levite to be the, uh, the, the, the priest of those graven images. So here we have this household with a, with a household that has a, a room of graven images that they worship. Yes. We have several bronze. We have a bronze Jayhawk, yeah. Oh. yeah. I mean, that may be a grave in <laughs> I hadn't thought about that one. But, uh, as it happened, as it happened, uh, Samson, who was Samson's uh, enemies? Who did he have problems with? Not just with women, but what kind of women? The Philistines. The Samson was from the tribe of Dan, and this tribe of Dan was positioned right next to the Philistines, and so they were in a situation where they were caught with too, too much interaction with the Philistines, and some of the uh, people in Dan just said, we gotta get out of this situation, we gotta leave. And so what they did is they appointed a, a group of about five spies to go out and find another place where they could move, where the, the Danites could move. And as they were in the process of looking for a place to move, they came across Michael and his, his uh, room of graven images and became acquainted with the, uh, the uh, priest, the, the Levite, who had acted as a priest for that, uh, that room. And they consulted with that priest, are we gonna be successful in finding the proper place to go? And the priest who was the, the in charge of those graven images said, yes, you will be successful. And they were, and they found a place to go. I think I do have a, a map of it. Here is where Dan is located, right in this region right in here. And they found a place way up here north of, <coughs> north of the Sea of Galilee. And they went back to Dan, they went back to the home, and they said, look, we found a proper place to go, let's go there. And a number of them <coughs> did pick up to leave. I don't know, I think it's a 400 of them uh, decided to leave. <coughs> and uh, as they were on their way up there, they stopped at Michael. They, and they had, the spies that had been successful there, they thought maybe we should talk to that, that, that Levite again and see whether those graven images can give us some message whether we had the same success moving up further north, which they did. And then they took it upon themselves, since this sounds like a good idea, there, there's a tribe getting ready to leave. 
if those graven images were so successful, and this Levite was so successful, let's, then I said, let's take them away from them. And so here we have them taking their possessions away from the, the these are the Danites, I guess. Here are some of the items. You see a, a golden calf there, and here are some silver items. And they, they, they actually kidnapped that Levite and, and then they stole the idols. And uh, Michael and his people came back after them. And uh, they were able to convince that Levite that he'd be much better off serving a, a group of people than just one family. And so what we're told is that the, the, Dan, the people in Dan or the Danites left the region of, uh, in that the vicinity of Benjamin and Ephraim and Judah and left that and moved way up north, north of the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> they felt that they were said, Michael said, now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. Here is way up here. Is, is, is Dan. I think I have one more verse here. No. There's another uh, verse that I had in there that deals with the next story, and that is that there was a call uh, for men to go to fight against the, the tribe of Benjamin. And the call came from all the cities from, guess where? From the north and the south. From where? Does anybody know what the expression was that was used? From Dan to Beersheba. Beersheba is the further south, the further south that we find in, in, in Canaan that was possessed by the Israelites. Dan is the furthest north from Dan to Beersheba. But at any rate, what we find is that this successful uh, group of people that were formed the city, of, formed the tribe of Dan, which was part of the Israelite nation at one time, actually based their whole existence on what? graven images. I'm not exactly sure what I know what a graven image is. What does graven mean? I don't know. The other, the other, uh, the other story that is, by the way, if you have a Bible, you might want to read those five chapters. It's very interesting reading. And the other story is quite interesting in that there was a Levite whose concubine had been uh, raped and tortured by the men of Benjamin. And <coughs> what had happened is that people were so upset about it, they said some vengeance ought to be taken against the men of Benjamin. And, and an army was gotten together. This is where we get the expression that they called the people from all the cities from Dan to Beersheba to fight against the Benjamites. And they did, and they fought very successfully and got rid of all the Benjamites, except for 600 of them that were alive. And after, after killing off all the Benjamites, the next day they realized, hey, we have gotten rid of one of the tribes of, uh, of uh, Israel. That's probably not good. That tribe ought to continue. But at the time that they had made the agreement to fight against uh, Benjamin, they also made the agreement that nobody would ever give their daughters to be married to anybody who was from Benjamin. Now they wanted Benjamin to continue, and they couldn't get Benjamin to continue unless they had wives for Benjamin, and they didn't know where to get wives. But they all had made a vow <coughs> that they would never let their daughters marry a Benjaminite. Then they found out there was one city that that, that did not happen. And that city was Jab that city was Jabesh Gilead in the, in the province of uh, Gad. <coughs> that they had not made that vow, and so what uh, what these men did is they went to, to Jabesh Gilead, and they they kidnapped essentially 400 of the virgin women and and took them back to uh, Benjamin to marry those Benjaminites that didn't have wives. <coughs> they needed 200 more. And they got those by kidnapping some girls that were dancing at a, at a feast in, uh, taking place in Shiloh at that time. Uh, that, in 
connection with that story that we get that thing that, that there was no ruler, no ruler, no king at that time. And everybody did whatever they felt, felt like doing was ever all right in their own eyes. And the, uh, <coughs> the Deuteronomist, we presume was Jeremiah, was trying to make a point here. And that is that with a proper ruler, with somebody like Josiah, we don't have to have this sort of uh, behavior that, that, that was displayed by a lot of the people during that time of the period of the judges. The other thing that's kind of interesting is that Jabesh Gilead <coughs> is typical of something else that happens in the Deuteronomy histories, is that you get introduced to a, a certain situation of a person sometimes or a place that keeps popping up later on in the story and has some significance in the story. <coughs> if you think carefully about it, you realize that the tribe of Benjamin is associated with somebody else that somebody else was Saul. The first king of the Israelites was Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. One of the things that established Saul as the king is the success that he had had in helping the people in Jabesh Gilead fight against the Ammonites. They were very grateful to, uh, to, to Saul for having done that. Why did Saul do this? And I tried to find this in the Bible, but the chances are possibly that maybe his grandmother was one of those women that had been kidnapped and that the people in, in, in Benjamin held a relationship to the people in Jabesh Gilead. Later on in the, in the Deuteronomy histories, we find out that Saul was killed and Jonathan was killed in a battle and their bodies were hung up in Beth Shan for ridicule, just like the bodies of Mussolini. Remember seeing pictures of Mussolini and his mistress? There was Jonathan and, uh, and Saul. And the people of Jabesh Gilead came to rescue those bodies and give them a de decent burial in Jabesh Gilead. Later in, 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 in King David's reign, he asked about his friend Jonathan and his father-in-law Saul. Where are they buried? Oh, they were buried in Jabesh Gilead. David sins contingent of people up there to Jewish Gilead to retrieve those bodies and have them buried back in the, in the region of Benjamin. So the Jewish Gilead keeps showing up over and over in different places and it may all have started <coughs> with the relationship between Benjamin and Saul and, and Jewish Gilead may have started with the, with the uh, kidnapping of those women to be wives for the people of Benjamin. Now I'm getting tired, honey. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>